what are we going to do with the Sermon on the Mount? We've already heard 16 messages on this and now we're coming to the end of our series where Jesus brings things to a conclusion. Uh, throughout the sermon he's given us a vision of his kingdom and examples of how his disciples might live out this vision. But then he concludes with a challenge where he essentially says, are you my disciples? Then what are you going to do with my words? And that's the big question for today. Because, you know, we can marvel at the uh, beauty of Jesus' words, as many have done throughout history. Uh, we might quote his words, uh, frame them, put them on a fridge. But are we actually living them, obeying them, acting on them? You know, just hearing his words or listening to sermons about it, as we've been doing, is really pointless unless we act on what we've heard. If it doesn't result in heart change and uh, bear good fruit in our lives, then it, well, it's all meaningless. So as we come to the conclusion of the Sermon on the Mount, this is where we need to examine our lives. This is where we need to look under the hood, as it were, to see what's really going on. Because as we'll see, outward appearances can be deceptive. All that glitters is not gold. You can't judge a book by its cover. You might look like a Christian, you might do and say the right things, but not actually belong to Christ. And that is a sobering thought, isn't it? So we've got to look under the surface, at the heart, at the foundations, to see whether we truly belong to God. Because if we do, then it will be evidenced by our actions, our attitudes, our words and our lives, as we seek to do the will of the Father. All right, so let's read now what Jesus says in conclusion as he confronts us with three pictures that are presented in pairs. Two gates, two trees, two houses. Each picture reveals two possible outcomes, either a life that is flourishing or a life that will be destroyed. Let's take a look. Enter by the narrow gate. For the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction, and those who enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life, and those who find it are few. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You'll recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, and nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus you will recognize them by their fruits. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then will I declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall, because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. Two gates two trees, two houses. Jesus confronts us with these images to make sure that we don't miss the way to a flourishing life in his kingdom. And it's a life that we enter into by the narrow gate. That's the first analogy. There are two gates and only two gates. There isn't a, another option. There's no uh, middle way. And you can't just sit on the fence either. We all enter through one gate or the other. Now, the wide gate is easy to find because so many are entering through it. You know, you just follow the crowd. But why so many? Well, because it's the easy way. 
There are no restrictions, no boundaries. Anything goes. Do what you want. Be who you want to be. Live and let live. You know, there's a sense of freedom and independence on this road. But ultimately, Jesus says, it leads to destruction. So enter by the narrow gate, he says. Why is it narrow? Well, because Jesus is the gate. I am the gate, says Jesus. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved. Or John 14, verse 6. I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So it's not like there are many ways to God. Jesus said, I am the way. And so the gate is narrow. It's one person wide. And there are clear boundaries. You know, when we enter through that gate, we are committing to live for him. You know, we are uh, conforming to his ways. And that doesn't mean it's restrictive, but there are clear boundaries for our good that will enable us to flourish. It's a bit like in a, a soccer game. You know, if you watch a group of children trying to play soccer uh, without any rules or boundaries, well, it is chaos. Uh, as they all chase after the ball and uh, foul one another and end up arguing and fighting, and it really isn't much fun. People end up getting hurt. But with clear rules and boundaries, it's the best game in the world. So, entering through the narrow gate means living his way. Uh, it's the way that we've been hearing about in the Sermon on the Mount, and it means doing the Father's will. It doesn't mean just believing the right things. You know, there are lots of people today who profess to be Christians, uh, who seem to be very kind of doctrinally correct, but who can be found on social media attacking those who differ from them. And their hearts seem full of dissension and hatefulness. Right? It's the complete opposite to the attitude that we find in the Sermon on the Mount. It's the easy way, the way of the world. The way of Jesus is the hard way. The gate is narrow and the way is hard, he says, because it means denying self. It means taking up our cross and following Jesus, which often means being misunderstood and even mistreated. It means uh, instead of going along with the crowd, we stand out because of our sexual ethic, uh, because of our views on marriage or the sanctity of life and so on. We find ourselves out of step with the culture. And it means that we are uh, going against the flow. You know, it's much easier to go with the crowd, isn't it? But it's like the blind leading the blind. And Jesus says it leads to destruction. It's those who choose the narrow gate, who seek to live the way of Jesus, who are prophetic in this world. They are demonstrating by the way that they live their lives, right? So the way that they love God and love their neighbors, actually that there is another way. And it may not be so well trodden, but it leads to life and true liberation. Because you see, we're becoming the people that God created us to be. And we discover what it is to be fully human as we follow the most perfect, truest human being to have ever walked the earth. And we discover that all that was promised to us on the easy road was deception and lies, and it leads to captivity and death. But the narrow way leads us to the new creation, to the new heavens and new earth, to unspeakable glory. So enter by the narrow gate, says Jesus. Have you done that? Is that the path you're on? Is it evident by how you're living your life, uh, by how you're treating others? Maybe it is, but we still need to beware because there are those who will try to mislead us. There are false prophets, says Jesus, which would include false teachers. And, you know, they look innocent enough, but actually they are wolves in sheep's clothing. And they will come, as they have done throughout history, and they will try and get you to join them on the easy road. Beware of them, says Jesus, because their way leads to destruction. But how can we tell if someone is a false prophet or teacher? 
How can we tell if uh, someone is a wolf when they're dressed as a sheep? Well, think of a tree, says Jesus. And this is the second analogy. Think about a fruit tree. One tree might be healthy, another might be diseased. The problem is you won't know the difference by looking at the tree because appearances can be deceptive. The only way you can tell is by its fruit. Diseased trees don't produce good fruit. And that's how it is with false prophets and teachers. You will know them by their fruit, says Jesus. Now, that might be the fruit of their teaching. You know, what it uh, produces in people's lives. And I have to say, there are many online prophets and teachers today whose unaccountable words stir up fear, anger, and dissension. And instead of listening to them, we should be looking at the fruit that their words are producing and be wary of them. But there's also the fruit in their own lives that gives them away. Uh, their speech and character, uh, what goes on behind the scenes, which is why it's so important that we receive teaching from people we know whose lives can be observed. It's why it's so important that Christians belong to local churches where pastors and teachers have been appointed by God to care for them and teach them, where those people can be known and the fruit of their lives is evident to all. Sadly, uh, there are many church leaders in these days who have been failing and falling, where the fruit of their lives has been exposed and shown to be rotten. Instead of caring for others, too many have shown that they care more about their own egos, uh, their own ministry, and have been hungry for uh, power and prestige rather than hungry for God and his kingdom. And it's why we can't just judge by outward appearances. Because, you know, they may be uh, very charismatic, uh, be great communicators, or have great knowledge. You know, they may astound us with their PhDs. Or they may be very prophetic and have amazing insights. But at the end of the day, like a tree, they'll be known by their fruit. And because fruit takes time to grow, we need to be wary about who we are listening to and receiving from so that we don't become deceived. True shepherds should not only be preaching Christ, but displaying Christ-like fruit in their lives. And so as one of the shepherds in this church, I want to invite you to look at our lives Right? We're not perfect, but we are endeavouring to follow Christ and display his fruit, setting a, an example to the flock, uh, walking in humility, loving and serving people, putting others first and uh, repenting when we get things wrong. You know, we want to be accountable and for our lives to be transparent. We want to bear good fruit, not just in our own lives, but in the lives of all those that we serve and minister to. So, if you see anything in me or in any one of us that is inconsistent with the way of Jesus, then please call us on it. Those who can be trusted are those who are doing the will of the Father. The fact that they may do things in the name of the Lord, maybe even miracles, you know, I mean, they may do great things and, and get great results, uh, but none of that is evidence that they belong to Jesus. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, says Jesus, but the one who does the will of my Father, who is in heaven. Right? It's those who are, are truly living by what Jesus has been teaching in the Sermon on the Mount. Are those who are not only hearing his words, but acting on them, living them. They are building their houses, building their lives on the rock. And that last analogy of a house being built on either rock or sand is for every one of us. Now I'll be saying more about that next time in my last message in this series where I'll talk about our strategy for teaching in this church 
and the responsibility that we all have where it comes to building our lives on the rock. But the point I want to end with here is to say again that appearances can be deceptive. The house looks the same, whether it's built on sand or on rock, right? Outwardly, we, we may all look the same. We go to church, we pray, we give, we serve, we quote the Bible, we may say the right things, appear to do the right things. Above the surface, everything can look good until there is a storm, until things happen that test us. And that might be uh, the trials of life, or it might be relationships where we get offended or disappointed, but it tests us. And that's where we find out what our foundation is, what we've been building our lives upon, rock or sand. Will we get swept away or will we stand firm? But it's important to note that building on the rock doesn't just mean building our lives on the truth. It's not just building our lives on Jesus' teaching. It's actually acting on his teaching. Jesus said, everyone who hears these words of mine, in other words, everything he's been teaching in the Sermon on the Mount, everyone who hears these words of mine and does them, right? Whoever puts these words into practice, he says, will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. They are the ones who are building on a firm foundation, which is, of course, Christ himself. He is the rock. So when the storm comes, our response is to put into practice what Jesus has taught us about how we're to treat people. You know, not retaliating, but blessing, uh, loving our enemies, not judging, um, not being anxious, but asking the Father for what we need, praying for his will to be done. That's our response to the storms of life. We do the will of the Father. It's only when we are tested that our foundations are exposed. And it's how we respond that reveals whether it's rock or sand. It reveals what we're trusting in, whether it's Jesus or something else. Which is again why outward appearances can be deceptive. Because when everything is going well, our houses all look the same, don't they? Right? There doesn't seem to be a problem. So we've got to look deeper. We have to look under the surface. We have to look at the heart. And really, that's what Jesus has been doing throughout the Sermon on the Mount. He's been addressing our hearts. Because trusting Jesus and doing the will of the Father is a heart issue. And that's why Jesus said of the Pharisees, who were really trying to do the right things and appear righteous, and yet, Jesus said, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Could he say that about you or I? Where is your heart in relation to God? Does he have your heart? Being a disciple of Jesus and experiencing a flourishing life in his kingdom starts with a heart transformation. It's why Jesus started his sermon with the Beatitudes. It's the attitudes of someone who has experienced this heart transformation. Someone who is humble, merciful, compassionate, forgiving. Someone who hungers for God because they've tasted his goodness. They've experienced his divine love. He has their hearts. Does he have your heart? When we've been touched by his love and experience it growing, it, growing in our hearts, you know, it changes the core of our personality. And it starts to express itself in our love for God and for others. It results in a desire to do the Father's will because we trust him. We trust Jesus. We trust that he is for us and he knows what is best for us. When God has our hearts, the result is wholehearted devotion to him and to living his way. And that is the secret to building our lives on an indestructible foundation. 
and it's also how we'll be a prophetic witness to this world. When all the things that people have trusted in begin to crumble and get swept away by the floods, we will stand firm as a beacon of hope and a light in the darkness. So where is your heart today? Does it belong to God? Is it evident by your attitudes and the way you live? Can I encourage you to take some time this week to reflect and to bring these things to God? But let me just close now by praying for us. And I really can't do better than praying the prayer of the Apostle Paul in Ephesians 3. So let's pray. For this reason I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through his Spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people, to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ, and to know this love, to truly know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we could ask or imagine, according to his power, that is at work within us. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Now here are some questions for small group discussion. 